تابع له تابع له على ذلك اللهم عن الإصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم لعنهم جميعا السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخرا أهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم خص أنت أول ظالم باللعن مني وابدأ به أولا ثم الآن الثاني والثالث والرابع اللهم العن يزيد خامسا والعن أبيد الله بن زياد وابن مرجانا وعمر بن سعد والشمرا وآل أبي سفيان وآل زياد وآل مروان إلى يوم القيامة اللهم لك الحمد حمد الشاكرين لك على مصابهم الحمد لله على عظيم رزيتي اللهم ارزقني شفاعة الحسين يوم الورود وثمد لي قدم صدق عندك مع الحسين وأصحاب الحسين الذين بذلوا مهجهم دون الحسين عليه السلام صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد صلي على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجهم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته تسليما صلى على محمد وعلى Thank you brothers and sisters for the beautiful tilawat of the Holy Quran and Ziyarat Yashur. Without any further delay, I would request Sayyid Hader Hasnain to please come on the member and address the majlis for tonight. In your loud salawat, please. Allahumma صلى على محمد وعلى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله يا نعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير الحمد لله رب العالمين 
الحمدللہ میں جمیع محامدی کلہا علی جمیع نعمی کلہا والصلاة والسلام على عبده المرتضى ورسوله المجتبى وحبيبه المصطفى الذي سماه في السماوات أحمدا وفي الأرض أبا القاسم محمدا وعلى الأطيبين من آله البررة سيما حجة الله الباقية Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Love and intellect, love and reason are often perceived to be two dif very different and conflicting paths. The path of love is one path, the path of emotion is one path, and the, par the path of intellect and reason is a completely different path. And faith, of course, is perceived to be belonging to the path of emotion. This is one of the most terrible misconceptions that exists even between those who are faithful and religious. And this misconception didn't come out of thin air. This misconception indeed has a history. For over 1,000 years, the Catholic Church ruled over Europe. At that time, it was before Brexit, so that includes England. Ruled over this part of the world, this region, and influenced every single aspect of human life. Everything was under the control and the authority of the Church, of those who seemingly represented God and his religion. We also find that in Arabia, during the time that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was born and entered into this world, we find that there were Jews in that society and there were also Christians. So a lot of those ideas had certainly reached Arabia. Now, of course, a Muslim, and this is extremely clear from the Qur'an, believes not only in the Qur'an, but also in all the books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to previous prophets. And the Qur'an makes it clear that it hasn't come to cancel out the previous revelations, but rather to affirm them. The same Lord who revealed the Qur'an upon the heart of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam also revealed the Torah upon Musa alayhi salam and the Injil upon Isa alayhi salam as well as many other books that we don't know about. The same Lord who spoke to Ibrahim and before him to Nuh and after him to Musa and Isa is the same Lord who is speaking to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Therefore, all of the prophets came with the same religion. The name of that religion, what it was called in different languages of previous prophets, is not important. But all of the prophets came with the same message. What would happen is a prophet would come with revelation, with guidance from the heavens. And after that prophet, mostly even during the life of that prophet, and this continued after the death of the prophet, after that prophet, that revelation would be changed by certain individuals who that revelation was threatening to them. It threatened their position in society, their influence over society. They would change it until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, they would change the revelation. 
they would change the books of the prophets for the sake of their lowly desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy would send another prophet to correct all the wrongs that had been done to that revelation and bring people back to the true path, to the true religion. Now when it came to the Quran, because this is the final revelation that mankind will receive, this book needs to be sufficient to show man the path and to guide man to the path of his perfection until the day of judgment. Therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself promised he would protect the Quran. And indeed we find after the passing of 14 centuries, we read the same Quran that was revealed upon the heart of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So that message would be given from the heavens, it would be distorted. So the Christianity we're speaking about is not the message given to Isa alayhi salam. This is important to understand. But rather, that version, that tampered with version of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was calling itself Christianity. Now that version of that tampered religion had certain ideas these ideas were naturally present before the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, entered into this world and they had reached Arabia. Now one of the important missions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was to do what? Was to guide people back to the right religion and clear the misconceptions people had about what it means to be religious, what it means to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you find you find during his life, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, there were instances where he saw certain individuals from the Muslim community amongst his companions had been influenced by that way of thinking. And he made it very clear that this is a mistake. This is not the right way. Allow me to give an example of one of those ideas. One of those ideas was the idea that the reason for the downfall of mankind is the female. Why? Because according to that narrative, which we believe to be incorrect, but open the books of Revelation we have today and you'll find the story is there. And according to that narrative, Satan, when he entered the garden of paradise, I wanted to tempt Adam, he didn't tempt Adam. Who did he tempt? Hawa. He tempted Eve. She fell for his trap. And she presented that forbidden apple to Adam. The reason for mankind's downfall from that higher realm to this lowly one is the female. And therefore, and it, this is clear, you can read it, it's available. It's not a secret. Until today, this is clear. Therefore, what did God say according to that narrative? God punished the female. Not only that female, Hawa, who made that mistake, supposedly. He punished every female. With what? With feeling the pains of giving birth. It's a punishment. This is that narrative. What does the Quran say? The complete opposite. What did Islam do? It clarified this misconception. Because in the Quran, who is the one that is tempted? Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam. Who eats from the forbidden tree? Both of them. It's not the case that the reason for the downfall of mankind is the female. What else does Islam say? Islam, according to the narration of the Prophet sallallahu in his household, a woman who dies during childbirth is counted as a martyr, a shaheed. What other misconceptions did Islam come and clear? Another misconception was this idea of monasticism, that you want to be a spiritual person, you have to denounce materialism. And this is indeed true, till here it's true. But the method of denouncing in Islam is extremely different. 
to what was practiced before Islam. The method of denouncing was what? The ideal situation for a spiritual person, a person who wants to reach closeness to God, according to that version of Christianity, is what and was what? That the best situation is you do what? You live in a monastery. You distance yourself from the evils of this world and you do not marry. You stay celibate till the end of your life. Now, if you are weak in your faith and you can't achieve that, marry. It's better than being sinful. This is the view towards marriage. What did Islam say? The complete opposite. You want to get close to Allah? Marry. You want to meet Allah in a state of purity? These are the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Someone who wants to reach Allah in a state of purity should reach him with a spouse. Should marry. Some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had been influenced by that way of thinking. They had married. They had married. But they'd begun neglecting their wives. In what sense? Not in the sense that they wouldn't provide for them or allow them to stay with them, no. But they wouldn't go to their wives. They would be busy in night in praying and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In prayer, in dhikr. They stopped going to their wives. And this is something that the women were upset about. What else did they stop doing? They wanted closeness to Allah. They'd been influenced by that mentality. They also stopped using perfume. Because the idea is what? The more you detach yourself from dunya, the pleasures of dunya, materialistic pleasures, the closer you get to Allah because your soul gets stronger. You weaken your physicality, your spirituality gets stronger. So perfume and smelling nice is something materialistic related to dunya. This was a thinking. And you can see where they're coming from. They stopped going to their wives. They stopped using perfume and they stopped eating meat. They became vegetarians. At that time, I don't think veganism existed as a concept, but they became vegetarians. They stopped eating meat. Now, some of these wives, really, they were very upset. They would beautify themselves with their husbands. The husband would pay no attention. Too busy on the prayer mat. What happened? There were incidents where it's related that one of these wives, and I don't know if this is, was repeated how many times this was repeated, but it seems it wasn't only one companion. It was something that this way of thinking had entered into the Muslim community, and many were thinking along, the, this, along these lines. One of the wives of one of these companions is so hurt by the fact that her husband is not paying attention to her that she goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And she complains to the Messenger of Allah about her husband. And she says, my husband, he, stops eating, he stopped eating meat, stopped using perfume, and stopped coming and paying attention to me and coming to me. It's related to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, became angry. This is the anger of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He went to the masjid, he ascended the member, and he addressed the people of Medina. And it's related, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, I've heard that some of my companions don't go to their wives. They don't use perfume and they don't eat meat. I, the Messenger of Allah, go to my wives. I use perfume and I consume meat and whoever leaves my sunnah is not from me. Meaning Islam came and clarified this misconception because the reality is the path of spirituality is right through this world of physicality. It's not something detached from your day-to-day -day life. Every act you do should be an act of spirituality. And therefore you find in Islam you have what? Even when you want to eat, do it in Allah's name. Remember Allah there. When you want to, ajallakum Allah, use the bathroom, first use Allah's name. Even that should be a spiritual action. When you leave your house, leave in Allah's name. When you get married, marry in Allah's name. The way he said, we spoke about that 
in the previous night a little bit. It's not something, the spiritual path, and not something detached from your day-to-day -day life. And it was so important and crucial for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to get that through to his ummah. Yet unfortunately we find today that unfortunately even until today, some of those ideas still exist. Unfortunately. Is there an element of monasticism in Islam? An element? Yes. It's related that Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam said, Rahbaniyatul mu'min, if I remember the Arabic correctly, Rahbaniyatul mu'min salatul layl, the monasticism of the believer, that detachment away from everything except Allah is his night prayer. The 11 rak'at that Allah has ordained as the optional night prayer that you perform before the Fajr prayer in the last third of the night about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran. That is the extent of monasticism for the mu'min. That is your one-on-one -on -one time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To that extent, Islam says yes. To that extent. And the message of Islam is what? Indeed, you divorce the dunya, but where? While being inside the dunya. You divorce it in your heart. Meaning you live in the dunya, but don't let the dunya live inside you. And this is much harder than running away to a mountain. Allah says that, you know, the hardest spiritual exercise for a human being, the hardest one. You want the hardest one to get the best results? The hardest one is following the Sharia. You want to be really hard on yourself to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Just follow this religion. Really? Why? He explains. Because... Following this sharia, ah, following this religion, is the continuous slaughter of your lower self. Because with every action you first think, does Allah want this from me or not? Before you get married, what do you think? Does Allah want this from me or not? Is this the person that will help me get to Allah or not? Before you eat, is Allah pleased or not? Before you fast, is Allah pleased or not? You see? It's about breaking the idol of the self. Some people don't understand this. They say what? You say, look, you are ill. Fasting in the month of Ramadan is detrimental to your health. It will harm you, but he still fasts. You say, Allah is saying it's haram for you to fast. He still fasts. So who are you worshipping? Is it Allah or your desires? So that fasting was not for the sake of Allah. It was for the sake of making you feel good about yourself. See? The hardest spiritual exercise is following this religion. And sometimes when people become more spiritual, they become imprisoned by those very acts of worship, forgetting that they were just a means to get you to the worshipped one. Allahu Akbar. We had someone, Shaheed Murtadha Mutahari Rahmatullah, and he speaks about this story in a beautiful manner. We had someone, an ascetic, who was known as having renounced the dunya, but he didn't go the right way about it. Didn't go the way the Quran Ahl Bayt said. He lived in a certain part of the Muslim world and he had dug his own grave ready. He would go there, he would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mind with the definition of worship that he thought, not what the Quran says. Because worship in Islam, being a servant of Allah is a lifestyle. He would recite dhikr, he would pray, he would do dua, and he was known by people as someone who's divorced the dunya, because people left the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt about everything. <laughs> they came to him one day, and they said, do you know that al Hussein ibn Ali has been killed? 
he uttered the following sentence, Allah's mercy be distanced from an ummah, a nation that martyred the son of their prophet's daughter. After uttering this sentence, he said astaghfirullah. Because he felt that sentence he uttered was what? Was not dhikrullah, was not remembrance of Allah. He did istighfar for that. This is one way. Or you come to Karbala with your Imam. You defend him, you defend his household. Which is the right way? Which is the right way? As followers of Ahlul Bayt, Imama is extremely important. The way to Allah is by means of obedience to the Imam of your time. There were some individuals during the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the month of Ramadan came, everyone was fasting. One of the battles, I believe it was the battle of Badr, took place in the month of Ramadan. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa orders, we have to leave Medina. They left Medina, and you know when you are in a state of travel, you cannot fast. It's not permissible for you to fast. The Messenger of Allah opened his fast. Most of his companions followed him in opening their fast. Opening as in they broke their fast. Some of his companions kept fasting. See, you didn't understand that, this concept. That the way to Allah is by means of the Imam of your time. When he says fast, you fast. When he says open your fast, open your fast. But we don't realize sometimes that the whole aim of this religion is to break your ego. Become an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say that the distance between yourself and Allah is just a single step. And that step is you. You want to get to Allah? Step over yourself. Moment by moment you say to yourself, what does Allah want? Does Allah want me to give this lecture? Or is that what I want? Why do you choose that center over that one? Really, because Allah wants that from you? Or because they pay better? More people come? Is it really about Allah? So Islam came and clarified these misconceptions. Now one of those misconceptions which Islam came and clarified is what? That the way of intellect is one path and the way of love is another. And this is a misconception that's intentionally instilled within us, even today. Look at the movies, look at the cartoons especially. Sometimes a parent, obviously you need your time to relax and chill out. But sometimes the mistake that is made is what? Is that the easiest thing to do, give your son, your daughter a tablet, go watch TV. Do you know what you're doing when you do that? You are literally giving your child to a stranger and saying to that stranger, do whatever you want with the mind of this child. The tarbiyah of this child is being done by those who run the media. So you find this child grows up, reaches the age of puberty, should be ready to get married. A lot of their ideas about marriage is from where? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So one of those ideas is the following, that the love, sorry, that love is one path, emotion is one path, and intellect is a different one and that love and intellect are always at war with one another. However, when we come to the Qur'an, we find something very different. Very different indeed. When we come to the Qur'an, you see, sometimes other religions, they say what? They say that if you want to believe, take a leap of faith. Meaning what? You don't understand it. But belief isn't about understanding. It's about your heart, your emotions. Right? Islam says what? The absolute opposite. There cannot be any true Iman, belief in the heart, unless, unless you understood it first yourself. 
You see, no book in the history of mankind has invited, ordered the human being to use his own intellect and reason more than the Quran. You find the Quran is filled with the following verses, verses such as the following. Afala ta'aqinun often comes at the end of many verses. Do they not use their intellect? Do you not think? Do you not use their, your intellect? We have a beautiful verse of Quran that states the following. Afala yatadabbaroon al-Quran am ala qulubin aqfaluha. Do they not think over the Quran? Do they not think about these verses they're reciting? Or are their hearts locked up? The Quran didn't come for us to own recite it for those who passed away. The Quran didn't come for us only to recite it in the month of Ramadan and feel like a hero. I finished the Quran. What did you understand from the Quran? It's insulting, Wallah. Over 6,000 ayat, Allah spoke to you. And I'm not interested to know what he's saying. It's related, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said, he told us to be in the following manner, when you recite the Qur'an, your aim shouldn't be to finish the surah. Meaning what? Meaning, think about what you're reciting. Nowhere in the Qur'an do we have the order to recite the Qur'an for the sake of reward. Rather, we have what? The order to recite the Qur'an for the sake of understanding. This is why Allah revealed the Qur'an, so that mankind ponders over its verses. It's related from Abu Abdullah alayhi salam that he stated the following, that a youth who recites the Qur'an, again, not reciting like a parrot, reciting like a human being, thinking over its verses, understanding what it's saying, contemplating over it. A youth who recites the Qur'an, the Qur'an mixes with his flesh and blood. These are the days to build a relationship with the Qur'an. These are the days. Don't leave it till your old age. Don't leave it till your old age. So the Qur'an comes and clarifies. Do they not think? Do they not reason? Why don't you think again and again and again and again? Insisting on this point to the extent that the noble Qur'an states, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That it is not for any person to believe to have Iman except with Allah's permission. And the verse finishes with the following sentence And Allah places defilement, and this is obviously spiritual defilement, places filth upon who? Those people who don't use their intellect, those people who don't think. So Iman and intellect are mentioned together. And the Quran mentions those who, they begin their journey from where? They begin by looking at the heavens, looking at the earth, looking at the mountains, and they think about it. They think about it, they ponder over it, they use their intellect. When they do that, they naturally reach the following conclusion. This can't come out of nowhere. It has a creator, we have a creator. Oh our Lord, you didn't create all this for the sake of nothing. But where did that journey begin from? From thinking. By using their intellect, this leads to Iman. This leads to Iman. You know, brothers, sisters, intellect in Islam is sacred. Intellect, al-aql, the intellect Allah placed within every single one of you, is just as infallible as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. These are the teachings of the Qur'an, the Ahlul Bayt. Yes? In a beautiful hadith in Usul al-Kafi, which is one of our most authentic books of hadith, the following narration is present. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the intellect, al-aql. He said to it, he ordered it, come forward. It came forward. He ordered it, go back. It went back. After which he said, I swear, by my might and authority, 
and my grandeur and magnificence. I have not created a creation more beloved to me than you. It is you who I will order. I, it is you who I will forbid. Which is why, dear brothers and sisters, in fiqh, we find that word. We find that individuals whose intellect has not developed, they don't have any duties. Why? Because Allah orders which part of the human being? He orders his intellect. He speaks to his intellect. Therefore, someone who doesn't have uh, that intellectual capacity is excused from all duties. There is nothing upon them. There is no duty upon them. No prayer, no fasting, no hijab, nothing. Nothing. They have no duties. What are the reasons that a child, before reaching that age of maturity, doesn't have duties in Islam is exactly this. It's about the intellect. It's related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what in this hadith? That, oh intellect, it is you who I will order. It is you who I will command. It is you who I will forbid. Meaning, I speak to you. The Quran speaks to the intellect. The Ahl Bayt speak to the intellect. The intellect is a sacred reality. It's a heavenly reality placed within the human being. It is the voice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking from within yourself. So when your intellect tells you to do something, you don't need a hadith. When your intellect tells you to do something and you are certain it's your intellect, you don't need a verse of Quran. You don't. But there is something much deeper which we don't have too much time to get into. But it's a shame not to mention anything of it at all. So I'll mention part of it, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, the world we live in, this dunya, is called Alam al Kathra by many of the scholars. The world of plurality, the realm of plurality. Why? Because we have the, this world, the physical realm, where reality cannot be manifested in its complete sense. Okay? That realm the higher realms from which we came and to which we'll return is called what? Alamul Wahda. The world of unity. Their reality is shown to a person. This world lacked the capacity to show reality 100% exactly as it is. But on Judgment Day, we will see the reality. All of us. Okay? Now, we find in our narrations that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam stated the following. Awwalu ma khalaq Allah al-aql. The first thing that Allah created was the intellect al-aql. We also find in the narrations that Jabir came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and asked the following. What is the first thing that Allah created? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam replied with the following, Nuru nabiyyikum ya Jabir. The first thing Allah created was the light of your Prophet. Now when we put these two things together, we find what? The aql, the intellect, is the very light of the soul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Meaning what? Part part of that light exists within every single one of you. This is the answer to people who say, we sometimes don't find answers in Quran and Hadith, okay? So look at the Quran and Hadith from within. Rasulullah speaks to you from within. Your aql is his voice from within. That's how sacred intellect is. It's not something small. Sometimes in life, you might not find a verse of Quran to solve your problem or a hadith, but that aql from within will tell you what to do. When you submit to it, you submit it to Allah, to His messengers, to the A'imma alayhim salam because their light is connected. How is it connected is a different discussion. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And therefore you find in our traditions, in our narrations, the following. 
whatever intellect commands to, Sharia also commands to. And whatever Sharia commands to intellect, also commands to. It is impossible that revelation, Al-Wahi, Quran, the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt tell us one thing, our intellect tells us something different, impossible. Absolutely impossible. Why? Because the same one who revealed the Quran, sent down the Quran, sent the prophets, sent the Ahlul Bayt, is the same one who placed that same light inside every one of us, which is the intellect. How can light contradict light? How can guidance contradict guidance? Now the question may arise that if we have intellect, if we have al-aql, what is the need for revelation at all? Why do we need prophets? There are many answers to this question. One of the answers is the following, that while it is true the intellect, al-aql exists within every single one of us, it's not the only thing that exists within us. And this is the complexity, because apart from intellect, what else do we have? We also have Allah says in the Quran, surely the lower self commands man to do evil, except in as much as Allah has mercy. We spoke some nights ago about freedom, how when intellect is imprisoned by the lower self, it makes you into someone who creates an atom bomb and uses it. This is the intellect at the service of desire. It makes you into someone who can think of all kinds of different ways to torture innocent people. No animal's guilty of that. Because you have intellect, therefore you need revelation to guide this intellect out from the cage of desires. And sometimes shaitan will come to a person and say, this is your intellect even though you know it's not. He will make something your duty even though it isn't. It's my duty. I have to oppose that speaker and tell everyone what a bad person he is. It's my duty. Really? Is that really your intellect? Or is it your desires? But he'll come with reasonings. You see, human being is a mix of heaven and earth. That's one of the reasons we have outward guidance as well as inward guidance. When you are in doubt, is this really my intellect? See what the Sharia is saying. If it's confirming it, it's your intellect. If it's not, it's your lower desires. The other reason we need intellect is that intellect can't know everything. Intellect can bring you to a point where you recognize there is a creator, yes? But how do I connect with him? How do I worship him? Many times intellect can't tell me that you have to do that by praying five times a day at these times. When, which intellect can understand this? So here revelation, al-wahi comes and completes that part of the puzzle. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So Iman, True faith only enters the heart after understanding, reason, at taqul using the intellect. But what happens then? A human being reaches a level where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe, those who have iman, which iman, the iman that comes after understanding, reason, intellect but those who have that iman what happens they have the most intense love for allah so intellect al-aql is a guide to iman and that iman is a guide to divine love why is it that on the night of ashura Aba abdullah alayhi salam brought his companions together he blew out the candle, it was pitch black. And it's related, he said to them, leave me. They don't want to kill you, they only want to kill me. Are you embarrassed to face the people? I'll give you a reason. Take the hand of one of the members of my household so you, have, you don't feel embarrassed in front of people. 
Why did he do that? Maybe one of the reasons was the following. In that moment, in that moment, he elevated, he saved his companions. Some people left, by the way. Not everyone stayed, yes? Some people left. But those who stayed, stayed only for one reason. And that was that they had reached a state of being infatuated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was only one reason to stay. Because you knew you were going to die. Not only that, you knew the one you were protecting is going to die. All you're going to achieve by saying is what? Just delay his death for some minutes, right? There was no chance of Al Hussein alayhi salam surviving physically. The companions knew that. Some people go or would go in the past to battles perhaps because of what? Because even if I die, my name will stay alive, right? People will remember me as a great man, a hero. But the companions of Al Hussein didn't even have that motivation. Why? Because the government, the media of that time is in the, in the hands of the enemies of Al Hussein. The only reason they could have stayed was love. This is why the Shuhada of Karbala have a status no one else does. They had no other motivation. There was no honor in terms of dunya. There was no victory on the battlefield. What did you fight for? There was only one motivation, that was love. That was love. You know, one of the reasons that poets, who are, you know, the mystical poets, people of the heart, they often refer to love, divine love, as wine, is because that condition of divine love cannot be conveyed in language. They have to use metaphors. Why do they use wine? Why do they use wine as a metaphor for love? Maybe because of the following reason. You know what? There is a, there's a um, similarity between the state of being drunk and the state of being in love. There is a similarity and a difference. What's the similarity? The similarity is that it's a move away from intellect. The difference is that when you are drunk with the forbidden wine of dunya, it's a descent from intellect. But when you enter the realm of Allah's love, it's an ascent from intellect. It's the next level above, beyond intellect. And we find that in the journey of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam, both love and intellect are together. Before reciting the Masaib, I'd like to read from this book, Luhuf, a little bit, just to show part of that, the fact that intellect always accompanied Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. When Muawiyah passed away, the governor of Medina was a man called Walid ibn Utbah. Now Yazid gained authority and he wrote to Walid saying, take bay'ah allegiance from the people of Medina for me and especially take allegiance from Al Hussein. And if he doesn't give allegiance, strike his head, strike his neck. What happened? The governor of Medina called Al Hussein alayhi salam. Now, how did Aba Abdullah go? Look at intellect, look at this reason, look at this thinking, this thought process. How did Aba Abdullah go there? Did he go alone? No. He took 30 men with him. He took 30. Why? Maybe because he knows when he enters into that room, anything could happen. So he had his force, his supporters ready outside all so calculated in the mind of the imam 30 men from the people of his house and also his followers he was told by the governor that yazid has said you have to do bay'ah how did the imam reply ayyuhal amir oh amir a ruler of the city 
Innal bay'ata la takunu sirran. Bay'ah is not done in a closed room. Allegiance is not given in a closed room. Walakin ida da'awt al-nas ghadan. But if you call the people in the city to give allegiance tomorrow, call us with them. Allahu Akbar, look how clever the Imam is. Look how clever he is. This is the intellect. A certain con conversation continues. Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who hated the Ahlul Bayt, is present there. He said to the Amir, no, take it by force. The Amir of Medina didn't want to force Al Hussein alayhi salam because he knew the position of Al Hussein alayhi salam. Yes, yes, he was working for the Bani Umayyah, but he still had some light in his heart. So when Marwan ibn al Hakam insists, Al Hussein alayhi salam gets angry, there is a dispute between them. After which, Aba Abdullah alayhi salam says the following words Ayyuha al Amir, O Amir. إن أهل البيت النبوة ومعدن الرسالة ومختلف الملائكة. Do you know who we are? We are the household of prophethood. We are the minds of the divine message. We are the places that angels always descend upon. وبنا فتح الله وبنا ختم الله. By means of us, Allah opens, and by means of us, Allah closes. ويزيد رجل فاسق شارب الخمر قاتل النفس المحرمة معلن بالفسق. He's explaining his reasons. Allah, look at this intellect. As for Yazid, this is who we are. Look at who we are. We are the places the angels descend. Who is Yazid? He is a man who is sinful, a man who openly dis disobeys Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, a murderer. A drinker of that which is impermissible. Laysa lahu hadhil manzila. He doesn't have this position that we have. Wa mithli la yubayu wa mithla. One like me doesn't give allegiance to one like him. He explains his reasoning. Reason is on our side. The path of Al Hussein alayhi salam is the path of reason. And the path of Al Hussein alayhi salam is the path of love because they are a single path. Sallallahu alayhi Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu Sallallahu alayk Ya Aba Abdullah La ilaha illallah Ya Aba Abdullah Ya Aba Abdullah Nadai Ashura Approaching some days have passed now. The caravan of love is present upon the sands of Karbala. Allow me to say this again over and over until it enters our heart. We can't bear to hear more than one Muslim every night. It's too much for us to bear. But Abu Abdullah didn't have ten nights to mourn over his companions, to mourn over his household. Within one morning, one afternoon, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. 
Allah Ya Aba Abdullah Forgive me, I'm ashamed I'm ashamed I run out of tears so quickly I know everything you did was only for me so that this message could reach me you did what you did in order to save me forgive me Allah. forgive me i run out of tears so quickly <laughs> There comes a moment on the day of Ashura. You know the companions of Abu Abdullah. Each one of them only fell to the ground one time. Each one of them only tasted death one time. But Abu Abdullah tasted death many, many times on the day of Ashura. Why? Because with every single companion who would fall to the ground, Al Hussein would die right there. Wallah, one of the hardest things is not to be slaughtered yourself, but to see your loved ones before you one after another. Who are these? These are the ones about whom Abu Abdullah is related. He said, I don't know any companions better than you. To one of them, he would come upon his knees when he came to his side. He couldn't bear to walk. One of his companions after his shahada, the imam would wipe the dust from his face. This is the love of Al Hussain. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. But there comes a time on the day of Ashura. No more Habib, where are you Habib, where are you Muslim, where are you Waladi Ali, Waladi Ali, Waladi Ali. Imagine the Imam standing on the sands of Karbala, looking left, looking right, and then looking back towards the turret. Where are you, companions of Abdullah? You're not here to witness the loneliness of your It's related in the moment, that moment when Abu Abdullah was going to get ready. When his turn had come, he was about to go. He gave the people one more chance before going to battle. He cried out, Hal min dhabbin yadubban haram Rasulullah. Is there any defender to defend the sanctity of Rasulullah? Hal min mawahadan yakhafullah fina. Is there anyone who believes in Allah? Who has enough fear of Allah that He will come and help us? Hal min mughithan yarjullah meghadatna? Is there any helper who hopes Allah by means of helping us? La ilaha illallah. It's related. He called this out. Fartafat aswat al nasai bil awin. The voices of the women in the tents. They heard the statement. They know what. What this means, they know Al Hussein is alone now. Their voices began raising and wailing and crying. No, 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 no. Sayyid ibn Tawus in Luhuf, he says the following. It was in moments like that that Aqilat Bani Hashim, Zainab al Kubra, Ruhayl al Fida came towards Abu Abdullah. But she wasn't coming alone, she was carrying a bundle within her arms. 
يا صاحب الزمان اجرك الله اجرك الله وتت شي ساي يا اخي او ماي برذر هذا ولدك this is your baby infant son له ثلاثة ايام ما ضاق الماء three days he hasn't tasted water فطلب له شربة ماء so ask them to provide some water for him Al Hussein alayhi salam took this beloved in his arms فأخذهو على يده he stood before the enemy وطال he said يا قوم قد قتلتم شيعتي وأهل بيتي oh people you slaughtered my companions you murdered my household وقد بقى هذا الطيف the only one that remains now is this little child this infant يتلضعت الشاع he's dying out of thirst بس قوا شربة من الماء take him yourself give him some water the ملعون said to that archer حرمنا عن سر الحسين and he answered him but in a very different manner not by giving him water he said, should I aim for the father? Should I aim for the child? It was said, do you see that white spot on the neck of that child? That is your target. The angels are watching. Allah is watching. Harmala. Hussein's heart don't fill with sorrow. Harbala, hold back your heart. Hussein's heart don't fill with sorrow. Your side was the Lord, forgive me. For the sake of Ali and the Nasser, forgive me. Make me worthy to be your ransom, your Sayyidi. But Harmala didn't hold back his arrow. All of a sudden, Abu Abdullah felt a heaviness in his arms. He looked down for a moment. It said the child was moving its tiny arms up and down like a bird mapping its wings. He took his sacred blood. He threw it to the heavens. Not a single drop came down again. But I don't know what is harder. Was that moment harder? Or the moment he had to take his little soldier back to his mother? ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله وصلى الله على باكين على الحسين أمان Inshallah, brothers, join us for Matam to lament Ali al Asghar on this tragedy night, on this tragic and mournful night. Come together, follow the brothers, form nights, inshallah. Do not be shy with the voices and with the beating of your chest. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh.
to your chest I want to hear from the end of the hall all the way to the front to these alams to the majlis of Abba Abdullah I want your voices to reach the lonely grave of Abba Abdullah and Karbala with your voices together we recite Abba Abdullah Abba Let Mother Zahra hear your voices to the end of the hall. Alhamdulillah. 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 With your voices, inshallah. Inshallah, Karbala, Abandelah, How does the moon and sun not collide, not collide, not collide, seeing the blood cover up your light? Up your light, up your light. How does the moon and sun not collide, not collide, not collide? Seeing the blood cover up your light, up your light, up your light. Why is the sky and rain feeling shy, feeling shy, feeling shy? How does the Arrow strike in your eye, in your eye, in your eye. Alone, oh Father, surrounded by your enemies, surrounded by your enemies. Alone, oh Father, surrounded by your enemies, surrounded by your enemies. Only you want to help. The sun is begging at your feet. The sun is begging at your feet. Only you want to help. The sun is begging at your feet. The sun is begging at your feet. If only I was much older, I would have fought for you, Master. If only I was much older, I would have fought Fought for you, Master, to be alongside the martyrs. Allow this for Ali Asghar. Allow this for Ali Asghar. Ya Ali Asghar. Ya Ali Asghar. How do oceans not crush up your lips? And to your lips, and to your lips. How do oceans not crush out to your lips? And to your lips, and to your lips. Oh, the river, how can you bear this? You bear this, you bear this. 
The door of wishes lies at your steps, at your steps, at your steps. The last door is taking his last breaths, his last breaths, his last breaths. I ask for water for the sake of his innocence, for the sake of his innocence. I ask for water for the sake of his innocence, for the sake of his innocence. I am begging you to show this baby some kindness to show this baby some kindness ask God my son open your eyes look at your father one last time ask God my son open your eyes look at your father one last time do not wait for your master when you can drink from the cold when you can drink from on the Cossario of the sun has burned, sun has burned, sun has burned, so weak how gently does your neck turn, your neck turn, your neck turn, your tongue the heat of the sun has burned, sun has burned, sun has burned, so weak how gently does your neck turn, your neck turn, your neck turn, how quickly did the arrow sever, a sever, a sever, before a farewell from your father, from your father, from your father, oh Lord, I ask you, for the sake of your Ibrahim, for the sake of your Ibrahim, I give everything except from me my Ismail, except from me my Ismail. My asker, I do, I answer when I will go face your mother. My asker, how do I answer when I will go face your mother? My son, I ask you, forgive me. I could not quench you with water. I could not quench you with water. Ali Do not be quiet, O oh brothers, with your voices, inshallah, together we recite. Ya Ali Asghar, Ya Sallallahu Hussain, Sallallahu Hussain, Sallallahu Hussain. I find in your place. 
face, my world and my faith. I find in your place, I only find heaven when I walk your way. In my chest engraved, your sorrows are seen. In my chest engraved, your sorrows are seen. I am beating my chest just to ease the pain. So Allah Hussain, so Allah Hussain, so Allah Hussain. Let your voices reach Kadbala, inshallah. So Allah Hussain, so Allah. Mashallah, Mashallah, Sallallahu Alaihi Sallallahu Each time from your dome, I fall. Traveler, help me find my home. Each step from your dome, I'm far and alone. I'm a lost traveler, help me find my home. Walking with my grief, hoping for relief. All my pain pours away when Hussein I reach. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sallallahu Zahra insha'Allah Sallallahu alayhi Let your voice reach Karbala Sallallahu MashaAllah Sallallahu My world and my faith, I find in your place. I only find heaven when I walk your way. In my chest engraved, your sorrows are seen. I got beat in my chest just to ease the pain. Each time for your dome, I'm far and alone. Each time for your dome, I'm far and alone. I'm a lost traveler, help me find my home. Walking with my grief, hoping for relief. All my pain pours away when Hussein I reach. Sallallahu Hussein. Sallallahu Hussein. Sallallahu Hussein. Sallallahu Hussein. Your door. 
floor, wailing on the floor, awaiting for the day that you call my name. I am at your door, wailing on the floor, awaiting for the day that you call my name. Years go by the day, my hair start to gray. Do you see your lover growing old, Hussein? Tears pour down my cheeks from your tragedies. Tears pour down my cheeks from your tragedies. My master, how do I keep my sanity? It's my love for you and your love for me. It's my love for you and your love for me. Oh, the world, hubbul ho, sayna jannani. Amiri Hussain, wa ne'amal amir. Amiri Hussain, wa ne'amal amir. Who is your amir, all of us? Amiri Mashallah, Mashallah, Sarallah, Hussain, Sarallah, Hussain. Your mother is listening to you, Sarallah, Hussain, Sarallah, Hussain, Sarallah, Especially the Munhamin and Munat of all the brothers and sisters at Al Hussein Masjid, those who take part in it, those who take control, those who do this majalis every year. For the Munhamin and Munat of our dear brother Sayyid Haider Hassanain, for all the brothers and sisters who are part of this program, who have helped in this program, who attended to come to this program, but could they not? Who attend any program of Muharram, remember Aba Abdullah, who say, who came and say, Ya Hussein, for all the Munhamin and Munat, especially the Shuhada around the world, and for them who have no one to recite Surah Fatiha for, recite aloud Salawat and Surah Fatiha. Ma'as salawat. Ma'as salawat. 